Okay, we're sitting today with Joe Scarborough, the host of Morning Joe on MSNBC, also now the author of a brand new book, The Last Best Hope, the subtitle, Restoring Conservatism in, and America's Promise. Welcome to Borders. It's great to be here. Yeah. So we're at Book Expo America right now. There's a lot of buzz about this book, a lot of discussion about it. Uh, for me, as I read the book, I saw it as a warning to the to the, uh, to the GOP, something that you've already started with, Rome wasn't burnt in a day. Right. You know, it's an equal opportunity warning to both parties, yes. really. Um, but it also a little bit more, a little bit more prescriptive than, uh, than maybe even Rome was. Right, right. Uh, it seems like you're actually giving a little bit more of a guide, uh, a path here for the Republican right. Party. Well, they need it. <laughs> the Republican Party right now is so lost. Uh, you know, when I wrote Rome wasn't burnt in a day five years ago, it was, it was a warning to Republicans. I, I had said if they keep spending money irresponsibly the way they had over the first four years of the Bush administration, uh, that they would find themselves out of power. And that uh, not only would they find themselves out of power, but our economy would be wrecked. I upset a lot of conservatives, upset a lot of Republicans when I, th when I said that. But five years later, people are coming up and say, well, you know, you had a point. It, it did happen. Uh, this book, though, I wanted to go back to the basics of what conservatism really was. Uh, because after Republicans got completely swept out of office, every, every conservative went out and said, well, this is what we need to do. And then somebody else would say, no, no, we need to go more to the center. The other one said, no, no, we need to go more to the right. So I decided to take it back to the very beginning of, of the conservative movement, and that was Edmund Burke, right after the French Revolution. And as I started looking at what Burke did, what uh, Russell Kirk did when he wrote The Conservative Mind and really revolutionized the conservative movement in the 50s. What William Buckley talked about. Um, I thought that, like a good conservative, looking back at tradition uh, might help us moving forward and trying to figure out w what direction to go. You know, over the past uh, 25 years, what's passed for conservatism in America has been anything but conservative. George Bush and the Republicans took over Washington. When I left in 2001, we had a $155 billion surplus. Of course, when George Bush left office, that was like a $1.5 trillion deficit. Uh, we engaged in military adventurism where Republicans went. And George Bush in 2000 talked about having a very narrow focus in foreign policy, the promising in the president's second inaugural that we are going to end tyranny across the globe. Uh, a lot of military adventurism there, and in other areas too, and especially in our temperament. We had forgotten the lessons of Reagan. Everybody loves to talk about Reagan's ideology. Yeah. Nobody looks at Reagan's temperament, a man who wanted everybody in the Republican Party. Reagan would not be telling Colin Powell, you're not welcome here. Uh, he, would, he would want Colin Powell in his party, and he wouldn't go around uh, demanding loyalty oaths from, from members of the party. Have you always voted for Republicans? And if not, you're not welcome here. So uh, we have veered radically off course. Republicans have not been uh, conservative over the past eight years. They've been radical. And we need to once again find the middle of the American electorate. And that's what I talk about there. Did you also spend some time talking about republicanism versus conservatism in here? Mm -hmm. Can you explain that a little bit more? Well, sure. Um, Republicanism uh, over the past eight years has been really the pursuit of power. The, the question that is, is asked, has been asked over the past eight years, has been, will this help Republicans consolidate power in Washington, D.C.? Instead of asking the question, uh, is this best for the country? Is this best for the conservative movement? Uh, is this best for taxpayers? Is this best for the soldiers who fight our war? At wars? Is this the best for senior citizens that are on entitlement programs? And it's so ironic that as I criticized my party over the past eight years, saying, hey, we're not being conservative, we're being radical, I was attacked by people who would quietly say, hey, if you don't stop criticizing your own party, you know, some bad things could happen. You're only helping the Democrats. I think what history shown us is that the fact that nobody would cross George W. Bush, the, the fact that nobody told him the truth about his spending policies within his own party, the fact that he was enabled in all of these different ways actually ended up damaging the party. You've got to speak truth to power, not only when it's your own party, but especially when it's a, your own party. There has to be 
again, sort of a leveling win. There, ha there wasn't that for the past eight years. So the voters rose up and voted us all out. You have some really harsh words for a lot of Republicans. You talk specifically about some of the, the, the elements of the past Bush administration and some of the people and players you think are at fault. But you're equally harsh to some degree on the Obama, Obama administration, specifically uh, the stimulus package and his right. own campaign spending you spend right. a lot of time on. Well, you know, I've been, I have been critical of President Bush over the past eight years for spending too much money. And the first two or three months, um, there would be a debate, well, is President Obama going to be as reckless as George W. Bush? What we have found out now, five, six months into it, is that it's just not a close call. President Obama's spending, now there's only one word for it, is, is radical. Uh, this is a president who, his first budget, uh, he proposed accumulating more deficits, adding more debt to our country, when, when we're already at record levels now, than all 43 predecessors combined. So now when people come in, well, you think he's going to spend more money than George W. Bush? Is he going to accumulate a bigger debt than George W. Bush? I said, well, yeah, not only George W. Bush, but all other 42 presidents before George W. Bush. And despite this fact, and despite the fact that this president has said we've run out of money, he's still proposing huge, huge spending programs. So um, it's, that's why, you know, at the front, I, I, I dedicate it to conservatives of all parties. I've got Democrats coming up to me saying the same thing about Nancy Pelosi and their party that I said about George W. Bush and my own party. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are conservative Democrats, conservative independents, conservative Republicans like myself who've said enough is enough. We've got to turn our back on this radicalism that for some reason has gripped Washington for the past decade or so. You know, your media, um, your media life has allowed you a freedom to enunciate your points of view, take on your own party, take on the Democrats in a way that, that you never used to do. When you came in, you were part of one of the most aggressive Republican freshman classes in history with the Contract of America. Right. It's in your show now on MS MSNBC, which is, you know, there's a lot of concern on the Republican Party about MSNBC in general with some of the right. hosts, has found a middle ground that seems to be working in attracting well, you, audiences you know, of both it, parties. It's interesting you talk about this middle ground because you've proven the point of this book, which is you can be as conservative as you want to be ideologically, but temperamentally, again, like Reagan, uh, we conservatives need to find the middle ground. I, I will have people call up my radio show or send me emails after seeing me on the TV show and they'll say, you used to be such a bedrock conservative. And when I even had a TV host on Fox News saying Scarborough's a liberal and waving his arms. And, and I had, um, I, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll strike a deal with you here. I offered a challenge. And I said, if you can find one issue where I've moved over the past 12, 13 years, from the time that I was called a right-wing radical in 1995 to where I am today, I'll give you $1,000 for every issue. Now, I've offered that on the radio, on TV, to other hosts and speeches. Nobody's, nobody, I haven't write, had to write a check yet. And you're exactly right. We went up there, and I talk about this in the book too, went up there breathing fire. And what I learned was that actually talking like this, or even laughing, actually helps you get your point across a hell of a lot more than screaming at the top of your lungs. You know, or, or accusing people who don't agree with you of somehow uh, not loving this country as much. And the partisanship on both sides is just tiring, absolutely tiring. Barack Obama has found the middle of American political thought, not because of his ideology. I mean, a new Pew poll shows that twice as many Americans call themselves conservative today as liberal, but he's found it temperamentally. He's cool, he's reserved, and again, he's got a temperament that a lot of Americans really like. So as you've had a time then to step away from that and to, to rediscover that temperament yourself, to find a forum that a right. lot of people are, are tuning into now that you're finding yourself comfortable in, right. um, have you thought about that next step for yourself? I mean, you're, it seems to be more of a position paper than anything. What about politics again for you? Uh, no, my wife uh, says absolutely not. <laughs> Uh, now, I don't think so. I love my show. I, in fact, I've been approached by Republicans that wanted me to run for senator 
a, a couple of times, and I think I've got a much, much better platform right now to shape the debate. Uh, you know, we're on our morning show. We've got Pulitzer Prize winners and top senators and uh, White House officials. I mean, the White House watches our show every morning, despite the fact we're critical of the White House a lot of times. They tell us outright. They watch our show first thing in the morning, and it helps helps them shape their communication message throughout the day. Um, it just one of 100 senators wouldn't have that type of impact on the debate. So I'm happy where I am. But the reason why I felt the need to write this is because nobody's talking about this. Nobody's talking about what true conservatism really is. Nobody's really figured out where the conservative movement needs to go. And there's a challenge to the Republican Party there. Uh, and it's simple. The Republican Party needs to reform or die. It, it, in, in this new information age we live in, you don't need a top-down party that was created in 1856 and 2009. You just don't. Well, when there's a gulf, uh, when there's that sort of movement, when a party's on a, on a low ebb and is climbing back up, there's a, uh, usually a vacuum in who's the primary communicator of the, of the main party message. And right now, whenever that happens, um, it seems that media, uh, whether it's Rush Limbaugh, Ann Coulter, maybe yourself now, um, sort of step in to try to help shape that debate. Is that because there's a lack of strong leadership out there, or do you think that there's a battle happening now to like really redefine that party? Well, there's a battle. There's no doubt there is a battle to redefine where the movement goes. In 93 and 94, Rush Limbaugh was the folks, the, the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Uh, those two entities stepped forward and helped define what the conservative movement was. Um, now, though, it's, it's fascinating what's even happened over the past week or two. Uh, after Colin Powell was told in no uncertain terms he was unwelcome in the party, um, I started going on our show every morning saying, are you out of your mind? We, what, we don't want, our, our party's not big enough to contain Colin Powell anymore? And started hammering that point every morning uh, on TV and on radio. This past week, I saw Peggy Noonan uh, wrote a, an editorial telling conservatives to grow up. Charles Krauthammer, who really I think is the conservative thought leader right now, at least among columnists, wrote the same column, saying Republicans, you know, we're not going to win back the center of American political thought by calling Supreme Court nominees racists or reverse racists. We need to elevate the conversation. We need to elevate the discussion. Uh, and we need to talk about ideas instead of attacking personalities. I th that's a message I've been delivering for a couple years now. I think it's a message that's finally coming in vogue. And uh, when you have people like Charles Krauthammer saying it and Peggy Noonan saying it, I feel like that's giving me some air cover. Because a lot, I, mean, I tell you, I, a lot of people on radio have heard the message from me and, again, are trying to figure out whether I'm a socialist or a Marxist for saying it. Well, I guess if you got them guessing, then uh, you're going to attract even bigger audience. I hope so. The book is The Last Best Hope. I really appreciate you being here, Joe. Thanks very much for coming to Well, it's today. great, great yeah. to see you again. Good luck I really on the appreciate book it. Too. All right.